For all its beauty and splendor, the wilderness can be a cruel teacher. Climbing a mountain is a dance with danger, a flirtation with the raw force of nature itself. Every step upward is a dare to the elements, a test of your resilience against unforgiving terrain. The allure of the summit is magnetic, but the path to its peak is a minefield of risks waiting to claim the unprepared. Please click the subscribe and like buttons. This is Outdoor Disasters. Mount Hood, standing tall in the majestic Cascade Range, an iconic mountain in the state of Oregon. It calls on adventurers and nature lovers alike. Its rugged slopes have witnessed countless tales of triumph and challenge, of climbers pushing the boundaries of human endurance against its formidable cliffs and glaciers. Mount Hood is an active stratovolcano in the Pacific Northwest and is Oregon's highest peak, standing at an elevation of 11,240 feet or 3,426 meters and a prominent landmark visible from miles away. Situated about 50 miles or 80 kilometers east of Portland, Oregon, Mount Hood dominates the landscape and serves as a popular outdoor recreation destination. Its steep slopes are covered in glaciers and snowfields, contributing to its stunning appearance and making it a hub for winter sports enthusiasts. Mount Hood is a popular destination for climbers, drawing both seasoned mountaineers and novices, aspiring to summit a challenging peak. Routes like the Southside Route and the Cooper Spur Route offer varied levels of difficulty for climbers. The historic Timberline Lodge, perched near its summit, is a national historic landmark and a testament to Oregon's dedication to preserving its natural beauty. It's also well known for being featured in Stanley Kubrick's classic film, The Shining. Mount Hood's allure lies not only in its stunning physical attributes, but also in the myriad of opportunities it presents for adventure, exploration, and appreciation of the natural world. For the students and faculty of the Oregon Episcopal School, their Mount Hood climb would be a tragedy. In May 1986, a cohort of Oregon Episcopal School students embarked on a hike up Mount Hood, joining the school's base camp outdoor program. The story begins on the evening of Sunday, May 11, 1986, with Frank McGinnis driving his 15-year-old son, Patrick, to the Oregon Episcopal School, where the bus would meet the students. He bid farewell to his son, but felt uneasy about the trip. Father Thomas Goman, the school's 42-year-old chaplain, and an Episcopal priest who is also an experienced climber who had previously ascended Mount Hood numerous times, led the expedition. Despite impending bad weather, Goman remained confident in his ability to navigate and ensure the safety of the climbers. Oregon Episcopal School, a small private academy in Portland, Oregon, ran a program called Base Camp, an educational experience modeled on the principles of outward bound and a requirement for all 10th graders who were scheduled to make the hood ascent in four separate groups. The idea was to help students grow by putting them in a challenging environment that required problem solving and teamwork. The students climbed aboard a yellow school bus, carried their heavy gear down its narrow aisle, took their seats and drove on off, looking forward to the adventure ahead to ascend Mount Hood. On board was Marion Horwell, the Dean of Residence and Student Affairs. Parent and chaperone Sharon Spray accompanied her daughter Hillary. Also on the school bus was John Whitson, nursing a hangover, seeking solace against the cool window. Despite his discomfort, he's excited about the trip, though not particularly fond of Father Tom. Ralph Summers had been hired as the technical consultant for all four of the OES outings on the mountain, Summers arrived earlier than the bus at Timberline Lodge and chose to catch some sleep inside his vehicle while he listened to a marine weather radio. A storm front was predicted by late afternoon. The sound of the school bus woke Summers around 2.30 a.m. Summers ensure the students are well prepared for the ascent. He's confident in their gear and optimistic about the climb's outlook, despite forecasted storms later in the day. Summers and Goman share a brief discussion about the weather agreeing to monitor it closely during the climb. Father Tom rallies the students, outlining the climb's duration and the ascent's challenges. With a view of the snowy slopes illuminated by starlight, the group prepares to ascend over 5,000 vertical feet or 1,500 meters, eager to conquer Oregon's highest peak. 
With thick glasses and a beard, people often mistook Father Tom for a mild-mannered librarian, but he was invariably the most powerful member of the climbing party. Goman had been climbing mountains since the age of 13. He'd climbed the major Cascade Peaks in Oregon and Washington, was a member of the American Alpine Club, and had been to the summit of Mount Hood on at least a dozen occasions. Four upperclassmen students on board were members of the advanced climbing team of the climbing program, Molly, Susan, Mick, and Lorca. The ACT members would watch over and inspire the sophomores during the ascent. If a younger student desired to turn around and descend, an ACT member would escort them. Molly Shula was a senior and had made successful ascents of Mount Hood since her sophomore climb. The other senior ACT member was Susan McClave, an all-league soccer player and captain of the varsity team. Junior Lorca Fitcher grew up knowing mountains and her father was a highly respected rock climber. Father Tom had taken his ACT members up the south side route to gain experience on the mountain. On each of these attempts, their teacher had turned the team around and retreated when faced with inclement weather. Mick Garrett, the second ACT member from the junior class, had successfully ascended the mountain a year earlier as a sophomore. Father Tom organized the students into groups and distributed climbing gear. Summers, confident in Goman's experience, acknowledged the plan to monitor the weather and turn back if necessary. With encouragement from Father Tom, the group embarked on their ascent. Molly led the group through Palmer Snowfield. Concerned about staying on schedule to avoid the predicted bad weather, she balanced pacing the climb without exhausting the sophomores. Sophomore Giles Thompson plods through the thick snow on Mount Hood's southern face. Despite his strength, the two-hour climb in the dark has taken a toll. The soft, deep snow has strained his knees and hamstrings. Spotting a rundown structure called Silcox Hut, Giles heads there for a breather. Mick joins him, barely winded. Giles feigns composure, but as dawn approaches, he realizes the layers are too much for the impending heat. Mick arranges for him to catch up after changing. Giles, relieved, sheds his raincoat, surprised by the climb's difficulty, but eager to tackle Mount Hood. Mick navigates Palmer Snowfield, realizing the climb is tougher than expected. The deep snow leads to exhaustion, with three students and an adult chaperone turning back. Mick eyes the younger climbers, fatigued yet determined, and decides to push himself further. Suddenly a climber collapses. It's John Whitson, expressing a desire to quit. Father Tom's reaction surprises Mick as he lashes out, an unfamiliar behavior. Mick notices John's anger towards Father Tom but intervenes, requesting John to return, a decision reluctantly agreed upon by Father Tom. So John and Mick turn back, heading back to the lodge. Further up, sophomore Pat McGinnis struggles with the bitter cold and fatigue, contemplating waiting while others proceed to the summit. Ralph Summers and Father Tom approach, noticing Pat's distress. At this time, the weather is taking a turn for the worse. Fearing worsening weather, Summers suggests pressing on. Pat with a classmate's encouragement, continues, doubting his ability to reach the top. As they near the summit, Summer senses trouble. The climb's difficulty and the encroaching storm worry him. He advises Father Tom to turn back, but Father Tom remains determined while Summers hurries ahead to scout. Then, the storm comes in full force, engulfing the climbing party. The sudden storm separates Summers from the climbers, forcing a retreat. In the chaos, Giles descends amidst low visibility and fierce winds, spotting trail markers and hoping to navigate back. Spotting a second trail marker, Giles feels relieved, hoping they will still serve their purpose. Battling the relentless wind and snow, he pushes ahead, realizing the urgency to move faster due to the worsening storm. Summers rushes back to aid Pat McGinnis and Susan McClave, dangling on a steep slope. With Pat barely conscious, Summers coaches him to use an ice axe to climb up as he assists them to safety. As the storm worsens, Summers suggests building a snow cave to shelter from the elements. Aware of the impending darkness and lethal conditions, Summers hurries to find suitable snow to carve out a shelter, acknowledging the escalating danger of the storm. Ralph Summers clutches his shovel, scraping the ice above him on the evening of May 12, 1986. For 90 minutes, he's been on his knees, crafting a cave in the snow high on Mount Hood. The blizzard's howls quicken his pace. Properly constructed, this cave will shelter 13 stranded climbers, including Summers. His facial muscles numb and his forearms ache, 
but he persists. Inside the icy white cave, six feet long, eight feet wide, and four feet tall, smaller than a four-person tent, he assesses his progress. With time constraints, it's as large as it can be. Summers needs to get the climbers out of the storm. Some show signs of hypothermia. Summoning his flashlight, he crawls out, nearly knocked by a gust. Twelve people huddle under a snow-covered tarp. One by one, Summers guides the climbers into the cave designed to shield them from wind and snow. But Patrick McGinnis, suffering from hypothermia, remains under the tarp. Summers calls out to him, but there's no response. Panic sets in when he lifts the tarp to find Patrick missing. The storm's fury obstructs Summers' view. Frantically searching for Patrick, he knows time is critical at this altitude. His heart races as he ventures out, calling for Patrick. Finally, Summers spots him, lying face down on a slope. Quickly, he rescues Pat from the brink of danger, pulling him up to safety. Relieved, Summers helps Pat into the snow cave, ensuring everyone's inside. Now, they wait for the storm to pass, hoping for rescue. Molly Shula gazes upward at the snow cave's arched ceiling, barely a couple of feet above her head. Illuminated by classmates' flashlight beams, the darkened space is congested, limbs entangled in an attempt to fit. Patrick McGinnis and Ralph Summers' arrival showed that not everyone can comfortably stay at once. They take turns, rotating outside every 20 minutes to free up space. Molly, lying on a thin layer of cold water from melted snow, tries to shift, but is pinned down. Suddenly, a noise draws her attention to the cave entrance. Father Tom Goman crawls in, shivering violently, his frost-coated head alarming Molly. He had been outside too long. Concern floods Molly as she sees Father Tom's distress. She recalls his kindness and her admiration for him, and it hurts to witness his suffering. Unable to speak due to the cold, she turns to Ralph Summers for help. They cover Father Tom with a sleeping bag, offering extra warmth and space. Despite his attempt to assure them, Molly senses Father Tom's worsening condition. Feeling helpless, she wishes she could seek aid, but knows the blizzard outside makes it too perilous. As she rests back on the cave floor, the howling wind intensifies, amplifying her sense of helplessness. Meanwhile, Mick Garrett wakes up in Timberline Lodge, disoriented and realizing they haven't returned yet. Rushing his friends, they head back to the bus, only to be greeted by an intense snowstorm, surprising them all. Worried about the climbers on Mount Hood, Mick feels concerned by the storm's severity. He anxiously waits, fearing the worst for his classmates stuck on the mountain, realizing that John Winston's hangover may have saved his life. At home, Frank McGinnis awaits news, worried about his son Pat on Mount Hood. Despite reassurances from school officials, he calls a friend, Dave, who alerts him to the massive storm. Feeling helpless, Frank's concern escalates, realizing the severity of the situation. He manages to fall asleep, but wakes up abruptly in his living room, anxious about his son Patrick's delayed return from climbing Mount Hood. The time and weather raise his concerns further. His relief at the ringing phone quickly turns to dread upon hearing that the climbers, including Pat, are considered lost on the mountain. The words weigh heavily as Frank tries to grasp the idea of his son, frightened and lost on the daunting slopes. It's 1.30 a.m. in Portland. Search and rescue volunteer Rick Carter converses with Barry Wright, both with Portland Mountain Rescue. Wright relays the grim situation of the student climbing group lost on Mount Hood amidst the fierce storm. As Carter listens, he gathers his survival gear from the closet. This situation seems perilous, reminiscent of the Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980. Checking his medical bag while on the phone, Carter confirms his departure to Barry, confirming the rendezvous at Timberline Lodge. He readies himself with layers of protection for the prolonged storm. A few hours later, Carter arrives at Timberline Lodge, keen to gather crucial information from the students who left the climb early. Despite their lack of specifics, Carter plans the search and rescue mission from the ski patrol office turned command center. Carter, fueled by impatience, stands among rescue workers at the ski patrol office turned rescue center. They discuss the rescue strategy, waiting for dawn before launching teams. Carter's urgency stems from the risk of hypothermia among the missing climbers, especially the teens. Finally, with dawn approaching, teams assemble for the mountain ascent. Carter leads one team, determined to find the climbers. Barry Wright gestures towards a Mount Hood map affixed to the wall and outlines their starting route. Wright has scaled Mount Hood 24 times, familiarizing himself 
intimately with the terrain. Tasked with coordinating the rescue effort from base operations, he's been preparing through the night, knowing that swift action is crucial in such harsh conditions. The lives of those trapped near the summit hang in the balance. Glancing at Rick Harder, the leader of Team One, Wright confirms his readiness, leading his team out, followed by another rescue squad. Facing his colleague, Dave McClure, another Portland Mountain Rescue Coordinator, Wright inquires, how soon can we get the next teams moving? McClure responds, they're ready, but we only have one snowcat. We can send up two teams at a time. Frustration grips Wright. The snowcat, while efficient on snow and ice, moves slowly. It will take at least an hour for it to return after dropping off the initial teams. As McClure briefs teams three and four, Wright revisits the Mount Hood map, meticulously verifying their search routes to maximize their chances. Meanwhile, inside the snow cave, Molly Shula feels an urge to move from the dampness but realizes her legs are unresponsive. Panic sets in as Father Tom alerts the group about Molly's condition. Summers reassures Molly that her legs are simply asleep due to pressure. After a few moments and deep breaths, the sensation returns, relieving Molly's anxiety. However, their relief is short-lived as a student, clearing the cave entrance, loses the shovel in the storm. Molly's wilderness training warns her of the impending danger. Without the shovel, the cave could become sealed, risking suffocation. Patrick McGinnis, inside the snow cave's access tunnel, fights against snowdrifts freezing into ice, threatening to seal the cave. Despite his efforts, exhaustion and hypothermia set in, leaving him gasping for air. As his classmates strive to poke breathing holes, Pat's resolve strengthens, fueling his determination to survive. Giles Thompson emerges from the snow cave, enveloping himself in a hug for warmth. Despite the storm persisting in the dark, it's his turn to maintain the cave's entrance. Ralph Summers advises regular entries and exits to prevent it from freezing shut. Giles heads to the tarp, sheltering the climbing party's supplies, hoping to find extra clothing. However, all he finds is snow. Panic sets in, and he desperately starts digging, his hands numbing in the thick gloves. His search is crucial. The cache holds not only clothing, but also food and a stove for melting snow into water. Struggling with the heavy snow covering the cache, Giles manages to uncover a corner but fails to lift it without a shovel. Defeated, he returns to the cave, realizing their predicament without the essential gear. Ralph Summers witnesses the group's deteriorating condition. The cold and lack of provisions are causing hypothermic symptoms. Father Tom, sacrificing himself for the student's safety, exhibits severe signs of hypothermia. As Summers recognizes the gravity of the situation, he knows immediate action is necessary. He decides to seek help and calls for a volunteer to go with him to venture out into the storm to get help. Molly Shula steps forward. Summers, touched by her bravery, prepares to venture into the storm with her, aware that the lives of those remaining in the cave now rest on their actions. With determination, Summers and Molly step into the raging storm, committed to finding help and ensuring the survival of those left behind. Molly Shula wrestles to move along the ice-coated slope stretching ahead of her. Ralph Summers was barely discernible through the driving snow despite being a few feet away. He gestures for her to follow him to the edge of a sharp descent. Swallowing her fear, Molly presses onward. Her mission is to descend this mountain and rescue her companions. Just steps behind her lies the snow cave that offered shelter for the past 12 hours. Nine classmates and two faculty members from Oregon Episcopal School are still huddled inside. As Molly inches closer to Summers, he pulls her toward the steep precipice and indicates the descent. We need to go down there, Molly. It's not a sheer drop, more of a steep slope. We'll have to slide down until the terrain levels out, then we'll continue on foot. Molly's heart races as she peers over the edge, but she nods in agreement. All right, let's do it. Summer sits down and Molly positions herself behind him, clutching tightly. Hold on as tight as possible, ready? Summers initiate their slide over the slope's face at breakneck speed. Blinded by the heavy snowfall, Molly fears collisions with boulders or falling off a cliff. The cold pierces through her snow pants as she grips Summers and screams, the wind muffling her voice. Gradually, their momentum slows, finally halting on level ground. Molly stands and surveys their surroundings. A white sky, obscured visibility, but a seemingly less steep path ahead. Summers checks on her, are you hurt? No, I think I'm okay, Molly responds, and they set off. 
Shivering, Molly follows Summers into the whiteout, well aware that their steps could lead to either safety or peril. In this bleak, snow-covered expanse with no landmarks, their mission to save the others presents daunting risks, each stride fraught with the possibility of salvation or tragedy. Meanwhile, Rick Carter braces himself against fierce winds, dropped off by a snowcat at 8,500 feet or 2,600 meters elevation. They advance on foot following the climber's presumed path, hampered by heavy supplies and unyielding winds. Carter observes Ed Hall, a longtime friend and expert climber, signaling a halt. Ed yells, we can't go higher. These 60 miles per hour winds are unheard of. My radio's freezing. Carter responds, tuck it under your jacket. We must reach those kids. Let's rope up and press on. Coiling a neon orange rope around their waists for safety, the men press forward, but the relentless winds overpower them hurling them to the ground. At 9,700 feet or 2,900 meters, still far from the summit, Carter acknowledges their limits. We've reached our peak. Let's head east, away from the wind. He radios for caution, halting the next team's ascent, hoping for a slim chance of locating the climbers in this storm. Ordering this strategic retreat weighs heavily on Carter, fearing it might seal the climbers' fate in this tempest. The team digs a burrow to change clothes, shielding themselves from the fierce wind. Despite the brutal cold, they must press on eastward to evade the storm's full force. Carter worries, realizing this storm could endanger even the rescue team. Giles Thompson, sitting within the snow cave near the tunnel's entrance, wraps his arms around his knees, swaying as he gazes into the storm outside. Amidst the freezing darkness, a sliver of morning light sneaks in. Observing his shivering companions, Giles worries, especially for their leader, Father Tom Goman. He remained silent since Molly Shula and Ralph Summers departed an hour ago to seek help. Snow encroaches upon the cave entrance, threatening to seal them in. Armed with an ice axe due to the absence of a shovel, Giles prepares to clear the entrance when Allison and Eric, EOS sophomores, offer assistance. They propose widening the tunnel as they exit to relieve themselves. Giles agrees, wriggles into the tunnel, and scrapes the ice with the axe. However, as he re-enters, He's shocked to see more snow has almost sealed the opening. Frantically trying to break the encroaching ice, Giles fails, accidentally dislodging Eric's boot into the tunnel. Helpless, Giles collapses, realizing the dire situation. The outside and inside are both trapped, with no solution in sight. Meanwhile, Molly Shula struggles through the thick snow, attempting to follow Ralph Summers' tracks. However, Summers is nowhere to be seen, leaving her alone and disoriented amid a whiteout. Spotting Summer's footprint, relief washes over her, and they reunite under a snow-covered tree. With Summer's suggesting they're in Little Zigzag Canyon, they move on, but Molly doubts his navigation, fearing it might hinder rescuers from finding the snow cave. Rick Carter assists Ed Hall, the final member, out of the shelter to change into their full layers for warmth. However, the time spent dressing and digging the bolt hole has cost them an hour. Despite being bundled, everyone continues shivering in the biting wind. Carter, observing the team's discomfort, decides it's time to retreat. He shouts over the gusts, proposing they head to Silcox Hut, a mid-mountain lodge located at 6,950 feet or 2,100 meters elevation on the mountain. Ed agrees, but a sudden gust catches Ed off guard, causing his glove to fly away. Left with only a thin layer on his hand, he's in danger of getting frostbite. The team pushes downhill. Carter worries about Ed's exposed hand and realizes they should have packed more gloves instead of just emergency supplies. Carter and his team finally reach Silcox Hut after a grueling retreat. Inside, they find temporary respite from the storm. The team is aiming to warm themselves while awaiting the snowcat for transportation down the mountain back to the lodge to regroup. Barry Wright, inside the base operations office at Timberline Resort, grapples with communication issues as his team struggle on the mountain. Coordination becomes impossible due to radios freezing in the deafening storm. Dave McClure brings news of additional volunteers on the way, but contact with ongoing teams remains sporadic and challenging. The mounting difficulties in communication deepen Wright's concern for both his teams and the missing students. Meanwhile, Ralph Summers and Molly Shula, relieved to spot a ski lift tower, realize they veered off course by two miles. With dwindling hope, they trudge towards the Mount Hood Meadows Resort, knowing it's crucial to return to civilization swiftly to save their fellow climbers. They reach Mount Hood Meadows Ski School headquarters, 
Upon entering with Molly close by, the room is filled with young employees. Summer speaks gingerly, stating that they're with a group of students lost on the mountain. Noticing their distress, a young employee rushes to call for help upon hearing Summer's introduction. Back at the Timberline Lodge, Wright eagerly anticipates Ralph Summer's arrival to receive more information about the snow cave's location. The climbers have been entrenched there for around 15 hours, heightening the urgency for clear guidance. Summers enters, recognizing Summers' evident exhaustion. Wright dives into the inquiry about the snow cave's whereabouts. Summers shares a tentative estimation of its location in White River Canyon. However, lacking certainty about the cave's elevation at around 7,200 feet, Summers admits he didn't have an altimeter. The absence of an altimeter troubles Barry deeply. It could have limited the search to a specific elevation. Now, the rescue teams face a sprawling search across various elevations, making a swift rescue significantly more challenging. The realization leaves Wright disheartened about the prospect of a timely rescue. Giles Thompson curls into a ball, huddling against the frigid dampness of the snow cave's floor. He'd fought to maintain the entrance for Eric Sandvik and Allison Litzenberger who are outside in the storm, but now he concedes defeat. Hours have slipped by without a word from either of them. The entrance has relentlessly shrunk over time. Giles gazes up at it. What was once a tunnel spacious enough for an adult to crawl through now resembles a narrow tube, almost impenetrably dark within the cave. Teeth chattering, every inch of him ache, longing for respite. The shivering of the others has faded as time crawled on. Giles dreads looking around. Uncertainty looms about the other's survival. A voice breaks the eerie silence. It's Brenton Clark, another sophomore. Her words come out feeble and strained. I'm awake, Brenton. How are you holding up? Her reply echoes the weariness they both feel. Cold. Just like you, Giles. What's our move now? Giles tightens his hold on his knees, contemplating the question amidst the howling wind. We can serve our strength to endure, to survive. He rests his head, eyes closing involuntarily, a whisper of doubt lingering about the chance of reopening them in this dire situation. Hovering above Mount Hood's south side, Ralph Summers looks out from a military helicopter. He searches the snow-covered slopes below, longing for recognizable landmarks, yet all he sees is an endless expanse of white. It's been over 36 hours without sleep, but the search and rescue workers with him rely on his alertness. He's desperate to locate the rest of his climbing party before they succumb to the mountain's harshness. Time is running out. If they fail to locate the cave before nightfall, the climbers will endure another harrowing night. A grouping of boulders catches Summer's eye, but thick clouds swiftly obscure his view. Frustration and disappointment simmer as visibility worsens. They can't continue in these conditions, risking a collision with the mountainside. Descending, Summers grits his teeth, knowing the storm prevents any chance of finding the cave. Time is critical. Delay means risking lives. Meanwhile, Frank McGinnis, deeply troubled by his son's plight, seeks solace among rescue workers at the lodge. Their stories of past successful rescues offer a glimmer of hope amidst the storm's fury. Grateful for their efforts, he exits the restaurant, only to be ambushed by reporters seeking information on his son. His emotions whiplash, oscillating between hope and despair. Barry Wright, coordinating the search from Timberline Resort's makeshift base, feels a pang of optimism. The weather has eased, allowing three teams to scour the upper reaches of White River Canyon where they believe the snow cave might be located. Despite exhaustion, they persist, hoping these efforts will finally succeed in locating the stranded climbers. Even amidst darkness, the rescuers can now make better progress due to the favorable weather. Wright's attention perks up at a new transmission arriving at the base. It's from Team 7, reporting the discovery of tracks originating from somewhere above them, appearing to be left by two individuals moving downhill. Barry spots Ralph dozing nearby and urgently wakes him up. Together, they question the rescue worker for precise details about the track's location. Upon hearing the track's direction aligning with their own path, Summers reacts excitedly. He identifies them as the tracks he and Molly made. Instructing Team 7 to follow the tracks uphill, they anticipate a breakthrough. However, time ticks by without an update. Finally, the radio crackles with news from Team 7. They've reached 7,700 feet or 2,300 meters. 
yet the tracks have vanished. Despite the disappointment, Wright urges Team 7 to continue along the track's last known direction, hoping for the best. He senses Summer's disappointment, knowing his deep sense of responsibility for the missing climbers. But rest is crucial for Summers now. They plan to send him back up once daylight breaks, aiming for a more successful attempt to locate the snow cave. In another location, Rick Carter, aboard a military helicopter, is en route with a rescue team. They've received a lead indicating a possible sighting of a red object near White River Canyon. As the storm clears, the landscape becomes visible, revealing the canyon's features in stunning clarity. Carter spots something in the snow, realizing it's not a sleeping bag, but possibly something else. Carter spots the second object and reaches for the walkie-talkie beside him. Base operations, this is Carter speaking. Do you copy? He ponders his next words, aware of the open channel and the need for caution. We've spotted two individuals up here. We're landing for a closer inspection. Lowering the chopper, Carter deliberately used the term survivors to avoid causing alarm. However, as the helicopter descends, he acknowledges the slim possibility that if these objects are indeed people, their survival chances are low. Rescue workers rush about, journalists swarm deputies, and a reporter tries to intercept radio transmissions. Engaging an elderly man, Frank learns that there's significant activity. Reports hinting at a discovery by the rescuers. But as the reporter loses access to the transmissions, switching to a military channel, Frank senses the gravity of the situation. The shift to a military frequency signifies something potentially grave, a realization that dreads the possibility that the discovery might not entail survivors, but tragic loss. The fear of losing his son weighs heavily on his mind. Rick Carter observes a teenager curled up in the snow and other nearby. His colleagues confirm the absence of breathing or pulse, a layer of ice covering their faces. Carter's radio crackles with news of a spotted object higher in the canyon. He sighs, acknowledging the grim count of three, leaving eight climbers potentially alive. When a rescuer approaches, Carter instructs against disturbing the bodies, urging a continued search for survivors. Although not in an official role, his plea renews the search efforts. Further up the mountain, Ralph Summers boards a military helicopter, the clock ticking past 24 hours since the recovery of the deceased climbers. As they soar, Summers feels the weight of scrutiny from Rick Carter, who possibly blames him for the party's lack of an altimeter. Spotting a familiar terrain, Summers requests the pilot to land, hesitating but holding firm in his belief. With the helicopter grounded, Summers leads a team toward a recognized ridgeline, finally sensing they're on the right track. Carter and Charlie Eck, an SAR team member, cautiously navigate the snowy surface, anticipating the discovery of the snow cave. A probe hits something unfamiliar, softer than rock. Urgency builds as they unearth a yellow tarp and a green backpack. As Summers guides them, they race to dig into the snowdrift, feeling a mix of exhaustion and anticipation. Finding the cave, they prepare for a final confirmation. Carter continues digging on the glacier, certain the snow cave is beneath them. When Charlie unearths an opening, they hear a faint moan, triggering a rush of digging to find a safe entrance, hoping for more survivors. As Eck ventures deeper into the cave, his hands tremble, not solely due to the cold. Hope for more survivors drives him forward. Coming across four motionless teenagers and two adults, identified as the climbing group's leader, Father Tom Goldman, and the school's dean of students, Marion Horwell, Eck observes their protective positioning. The adults shielded the teens from the icy water, arranged like wax statues lying across their legs. Admiring Goman and Horwell's bravery, he checks for signs of life, starting with a blonde-haired boy, his frown deepening when he hears nothing. Eck moves methodically, trying to discern any vital signs. Ralph Summers stands near the snow cave, motionless, witnessing the extraction of Giles Thompson and Britton Clark. While both are alive, Summers worries about their chances without immediate hospital care. Standing at the edge, memories of his and Molly Shula's descent flash before him. As a rescue worker subtly indicates he shouldn't stay, Summers grasps the implications and walks back towards the nearest helicopter. Barry Wright rubs his tired eyes upon stepping into the Timberline Resort parking lot at 7.30 p.m. on Thursday, May 15. For 62 hours, he remained steadfast at base operations reluctant to leave until the rescue concluded. 
However, the impending arrival of survivors demands his presence. A Green Huey helicopter is expected to land, carrying survivors to be transferred to a nearby intensive care unit. Volunteering for the transfer team, Wright seeks to witness their arrival firsthand. Racing forward with other volunteers as the helicopter touches down, paramedics emerge, swiftly moving with a stretcher. Offering a blanket, Wright watches as it's draped over the patient, revealing a teenage boy with curly hair. Initially relieved by the boy's apparent consciousness, a closer look reveals a devastating truth. His wide, vacant eyes signify his passing. With a heavy heart, Wright covers his mouth in shock as paramedics respectfully cover the boy's face and transport him to the medevac helicopter. Having been part of numerous search and rescue missions, this particular outcome strikes a deeper chord within him, haunting him with the image of the boy's visage as he closes his eyes. The 1986 Mount Hood tragedy stands as the second most severe Alpine disaster in North American history with two survivors, Brenton Clark and Giles Thompson, who had to have both legs amputated due to frostbite. It claimed nine precious lives. Richard Hader, Patrick McGinnis, Tasha Amy, Susan McClave, Father Tom Goman, Marion Horwell, Allison Litzenberger, Aaron O'Leary, and Eric Sandvik. In response, Oregon Episcopal School suspended its base camp outdoor program and conducted a comprehensive investigation to comprehend the circumstances. In July of that year, a panel of experts suggested that Goman might have been impacted by hypothermia, potentially affecting his judgment. Susan McClave's father expressed, we will never truly understand why he continued climbing, but he was a good man who wouldn't jeopardize his or anyone else's life. Giles Thompson pursued a degree in drama from Colorado College, later working as a master artisan with various theater companies in Seattle, Washington. Britton Clark, the other Snow Cave survivor, was discharged from the hospital in May 1986 without complications. Molly Shula graduated from OES in 1986 and pursued English studies at the University of Oregon. Despite providing a statement to the Clackamas County Sheriff's Department, she has maintained silence on the tragedy in public. Ralph Summers earned an advanced degree in sociology and counseled mental health patients. While criticized by some media outlets initially, others acknowledged that his actions, including digging a snow cave and seeking help with Molly Shula, saved Giles Thompson and Britton Clark. Frank McGinnis grappled profoundly with his son's loss, but has embarked on a healing journey over the years. His younger son, Chris, now a meteorologist and traffic reporter in Portland, welcomed a son in 2017 named Patrick, a cherished addition to Frank's life. The mountain doesn't care for your ambition, your dreams, or your age. It stands indifferent to your aspirations, offering no mercy to those who underestimate its might. It whispers warnings in the howling wind, etches caution in the icy slopes, and paints danger across the rocky faces. Every step, every breath is a wager against the mountain's fury. It demands your absolute respect, your unwavering focus, and your unyielding strength. It knows no compromise, no second chances. It tests your mettle, your preparation, and your courage in the face of adversity. If you find yourself stuck in a snowstorm on a mountain, seek or create shelter immediately. A snow cave, if properly constructed, can offer insulation from the cold. Alternatively, a tent or improvised shelter with a tarp can provide protection from the elements. Keep your clothing dry. Wet clothes can lead to hypothermia. Change into dry clothing if possible and use waterproof layers to protect yourself from moisture. Start a fire if conditions allow. This can provide warmth, help with drying clothes, and signal for help. Carry fire starting tools like waterproof matches or a lighter in your survival kit. Drink plenty of water to prevent dehydration. Avoid alcohol and caffeine as they can dehydrate you further. Conserve energy by eating small portions of high energy foods. Snack on nuts, energy bars, or foods high in carbohydrates to maintain body heat. Use a whistle, flashlight, or any other signaling device to attract attention. If you have a mirror, use it to reflect sunlight and signal for rescue. If you're lost or disoriented, it's often safer to stay where you are rather than wander further. Moving in a snowstorm can increase the risk of getting lost or injured. Panic can lead to poor decision-making. Conserve energy by staying calm and resting when needed. Use whatever you have to insulate yourself from the cold ground. 
Sit on a backpack or any available material to avoid direct contact with the snow. Learn the symptoms of hypothermia, shivering, confusion, slurred speech, etc. And take measures to prevent it. If someone shows signs of hypothermia, take immediate action to warm them up. Remember, preparation is key. Before embarking on any mountain adventure, ensure you're equipped with proper gear, clothing, emergency supplies, and knowledge of the terrain and weather conditions. For those who heed the mountain's warnings, respect its power, and embrace the challenge, the view from the top is not just a conquest but a testament to human tenacity, a testament to our ability to overcome obstacles, dream big, and to strive for greatness. Crucial information so you can navigate an outdoor disaster. Thank you for watching. Want more outdoor disaster content? Check out these stories I believe you'll enjoy.